How are you doing? This is David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave, the founder of the highest paid part time job in the world options training program. If you can hear me, you know, put a one or hit me in the chat. Let me know where you're coming from. Let me know the audio is actually going through and we're going to go ahead and get right into it. Right. So what we're going to talk about is why the insiders don't teach you to trade. And the reason why I keep hammering this point is because one of the things I understood as I started to get into more into trading, appreciate it, Dumakis, appreciate it, Rashida, is that a lot of people down talk trading for whatever reason. And I'm gonna kind of go into that, why they think, why I think people do this. And what they're doing is they're kind of uh when we start talking about this particular demographic that I normally market to. We're not being exposed into a way that one can create a lot of income for us, can get rid of a lot of income instability, but also can make it to where we have a better understanding of how the overall world works. We live in a political economy, so we live in a particular country, but also world and which is based on politics and economics. We don't really understand politics. We just kind of understand just how to vote, but we don't really understand political influence. And we also don't understand economics and we don't understand markets. We know how to consume. If you're going to be a really, really successful trader, you're going to have to start understanding economics and actual markets. And you're not going to a lot of the narratives that um, they're going to uh, give you about markets are going to be false. So let me give an example. When I have an economics degree, so I actually have a background in economics. I study a lot of markets. I've already been in business. Appreciate it, Erica. Um, there's a narrative you get from certain people on the political spectrum that they're about free markets. You also get this from certain ec economists that they're trying to use as a standard bearer for their line of thought, which is really not how economics works. But they are from the outside looking in. They don't really understand economics as a social science. So they come up with this term called, uh, you know, I believe in free markets. And they utilize this as the way how they think the United States economy should work. The problem is we live in a very advanced stage of capitalism. So once you start to understand capitalism is with your early onset of capitalism, you'll have free markets. As capitalism starts to become more and more advanced, you start developing cartels, you start developing monopolies. Why? Because it's in the best interest of those particular businesses to create these type of structures. So if we understand one of the fundamental uh, rules of economics is most people are governed by their own self-interest or their own self-incentive. If I'm a business owner, I really have an incentive to create a monopoly. Why? Because I have all the power. I now can dictate price to my consumer and I will not allow other competitors into my particular market. So a monopoly benefits me. Doesn't benefit me to have competition. So now the government now has to come in and regulate the environment to stop monopolies from happening. And the United States government has, had, has done this multiple times in the history of our country because you had certain business operators or business owners that had what we call monopoly power. So once you get past a certain stage of capitalism, there are no more free markets. There's only cartels, there's people trying to create monopolies. So what we see with social media and a lot of the, the, the heavy handedness of these social media platforms is why? Because they essentially have a monopoly on social media. They cannot dictate to people what they do and what they can and cannot say and all kinds of things on their platform, why? Because our platform is so widespread, we have so much money coming through our particular platform. We have so much revenue coming through our platform. Therefore, we now can start dictating to the point where we can take the president of the United States, regardless of what you feel about the individual person. We can take that particular office and push that office off our social media platform. And we don't fear any repercussion. Why? Because essentially we have monopoly power. Right. We can start dictating to other businesses how they have to conduct themselves on our platform or else we will uh, excommunicate them from our platform without any warning, without any due process, without any uh, way to get back on the platform. We just do whatever we want to do. So I don't allow a person to tell me that they believe in free markets in 2021, United States advanced stage of capitalism. If you want a free market, go to the Congo and deal with people trying to rob you and kill you and shooting it out or, you know, go to certain parts of Central and South America. That's where you're going to see free markets because they're at a beginning stage of capitalism. Once capitalism starts to evolve, you don't get free markets. When you understand these things, once you start to understand how the markets work and you understand how the markets work as a result of trading. So what I'm trying to get people to understand is that by us not trading, 
we're not educated on how the actual system really works that we're operating in on a day to day basis. So what it does is it puts us in a vulnerable position. Right. So I would ask the audience. Right. Because that's my opinion. Why don't you think you've been taught how to trade? Right. Because I'm going to give you another example of what I'm talking about. Why don't you think? So why do you think my problem? I'm trying to make sure we speak proper English. Why do you think uh, you have not been taught how to trade? And I don't just mean options. I mean any part of the market. Right. Why do you think you have not been taught how to trade the market? Right. Why do you think you've not been taught how to trade? And so one of the things in which a lot of the traditional financial people, a lot of them are on YouTube, I don't disrespect them. They have their rights in their own perspective. But I think their perspective is short sighted because of the way the market actually works. And let me give an example. A lot of times they will tell you that you should not trade. You should just buy and hold long term. And that's how you should get wealth. Now, I have one argument against that from an income standpoint. Right. I don't believe in telling people that are essentially making under thirty five, forty thousand dollars a year that all they should concern themselves with is long term buy and hold and not try to figure out how to get more income. And trading can bring more income into you. Right. So you can utilize trading to generate more income that you now can go sink those into buy and hold positions. Because a lot of times with my trades, I will become profitable on the trade and turn right around and buy stock with that. So it never leaves my account. I just recycle that back into a long term position. But I generated the income from trading. So I'm not a fan of telling people, right, that you shouldn't try to figure out how to trade. You should only figure out how to buy stock and hold it long term. The other argument is that. Well, you'll never be successful at trading. Now, I don't understand why they believe this, right? Because this is what I want you to understand. If I'm buying Apple and I'm holding it for 20 years, at the end of that 20 year hold, what is the actual price on Apple? Who determines that price? So I'm going to ask the question again. If I buy and hold Apple stock for 20 years, at the end of that 20 year time horizon of forecast and I get ready to go cash in my Apple stock, who determines the value of my Apple stock at the moment I get ready to go cash it in? That's the question I want to ask you on top of the other question I'm asking you. So who determines the value of Apple stock? Right. If I believe that Apple is going to be worth more in 20 years than it's worth today. Who determines the value of that Apple stock appreciating over time? Who determines that? Because we start, we, we got to start talking about market structure and how the market actually works, right? Because a lot of people have a misconception of how markets actually work because they come from a retail side. They've never actually functioned in the real market. And one of the things I teach my traders is that if you really want to understand the stock market, go to an auction. I'm from down south. I've been to cattle auctions. I've also been to auto auctions. The market is based on that same type of mechanism. When I was teaching people the options class one on one, it amazed me how many people had never been to an auction. That's normal to me. I used to have a homegirl when I was coming up with my sister's friend. She was in this thing called 4-H. It's like an agriculture club. But now they spread out to like cryptocurrency and finance. When we were coming up, 4-H was an agriculture club. There's an area of Orlando called Kissimmee. When I was coming up, Kissimmee was all farmland. It was essentially people out there raising cattle on these big branches. She was a black chick, but she was in 4-H. We went to an actual cattle auction because she had some cattle. I don't know what you call it, a female, I guess it's a cow, that she was auctioning off. And we saw how at the cattle auction, you bring the cow out, people put their bids in, yada, yada, yada. We determine what the price of the cattle is. Everybody goes home. The market works on that same mechanism. There's no guarantee that anybody wants to buy your cattle. You don't know what your cattle is worth until somebody actually buys it. So you may believe it's worth a certain price, but until somebody's getting ready to pay that particular price for that cattle, that's how you know how much it's worth. So it's the exact same thing with a stock. You don't know Apple's going to be worth more today in 20 years than it is a day until what? A trader is willing to trade that position for you. So the whole market is, is, is based on trading activity. So why do we have why do we have these people who are quote unquote buy and hold guys to down talk trading? When if you buy and hold, the value of what you're buying and holding is going to be determined by a trader. That's what people got to understand. 
So traders run the world. I had a book that I showed that it was about the uh, commodities trader. It's called the club of people that run the world. Commodities traders really do run the world. People that trade, e trade equities run the world. People that trade real estate paper run the world. Traders really run the world because we determine the value of these things based on what we're willing to buy and sell them for. And you don't really know what the value of something is until you actually are willing to buy it. That determines the value. It's not like retail where they give you a set price. The price is always moving, right? So I want people to understand is that our inability to function in this market effectively is because we really don't understand how this market actually works. And we're kind of spoon fed how the market actually works, but without really understanding from a comprehensive standpoint how the market actually works. And one of the ways in which you learn this is as trading. So what we find is a lot of the information has been coming out recently is that a lot of the people in our economy that are uh, in higher up positions, they're all trading. And they're never going to tell you about it or never going to inform you or never try to teach you. Then we have a lot of people that have come out of these traditional educational platforms that are traditionalists that think that, well, we're only going to tell poor and working class black people to only buy and hold. That's the solution to their problem. Because trading was dangerous. You can't be successful at it. But what you're buying and holding, the value of that is determined by a trader. There is no group of people that are going to say, well, you know what? If you buy Apple stock in 20 years, we'll give you this price for it. It's not like you buying a treasury. That is determined by traders. So if you go to get out of your Apple stock at a particular time, which Apple's in a downturn, you may not get what you thought you were going to get out of it. Why? Because traders are not willing to give you that price for it. It's always going to be determined by traders. So my question is, when you understand that's one of the benefits of it, wouldn't you want to be involved in this space? OK, so these are some of the reasons why we have not been taught how to trade. So uh, Melinda Suzanne says to keep you in a subservient position. I agree to keep you in an economic subservient position. Uh, the elite class want to keep the lower classes working poor. Yes, they need you in a position to work to support their position. So I tell people all the time. These people don't have a position if you're not in your position. They don't have one. Their position is based off your position, right? So they need you to stay in your position so they can keep their position. So the real radical work is trying to get poor and working class black people to make more money, to become more politically involved, not just vote, because then that changes their position, changes their role, right? But we don't teach that. You know what I'm saying? So if all you're going to do is just do what you've always done, nothing's going to change you got to start trying to think about how can i radically change what i'm doing and it's deeper than just some of this stuff that's templated that we've been taught for the past 30 40 years that none of it really works but we keep doubling down on it because it seems easy and it doesn't really stretch us as a person so to actually learn how the financial markets actually work to learn how to trade it doesn't have to be your full-time position but it's something that you actually have in your toolbox that you understand how to do is going to stretch you as a person and a lot of people don't want to be stretched they want to stay right where they at right and that's if you learn any market not just uh, uh the options market the stock market if you learn real estate market because essentially what y'all doing is trading real estate if you learn you know how to buy and sell cars utilizing some type of platform these are all really trading activities and this is how the world really works it's the average person that goes into a retail environment that thinks that the price of something is what the set price is, and that price isn't going to move. I tell people all the time, my prices don't stay fixed. Why? Because I'm trying to get you to think like a trader. And as a trader, you understand that prices always move. Prices move from minute to minute. So what we're going to roll into is this story about these two gentlemen working for the Federal Reserve. And I heard about this because I was listening to Jerome Powell talk. And he was talking about how he didn't agree that... Um, uh, people that are working on the Federal Reserve should own individual stocks. He felt like they should just earn overall general indexes. He says that's what he owns. And he was referring to that. And then this story came out that these two guys working on the Federal Reserve are actually involved in trading activity. Now, we talked about earlier how the Pelosi's were involved in a lot of trading activity. Now, Nancy Pelosi is never going to teach her constituency how to be traders. She has the money. She has the political influence. She can create a program today that can be bigger than any program I could create. And she could teach thousands of people in her constituency um, how to become traders and make them more informed of the market. What would that do? 
it would take power away from her and she would lose her position. So you got to really understand is that these people are um, in, invested in us staying right where we're at. And so while they're making money and they figured out how to become successful, they're never going to bring you in to get you that understanding of that success in a real and genuine way. I'm not talking about no scammy stuff because that's going to that's going to be a threat to their position. And so I want people to really understand that. Right. So now we're also going to talk about these two particular people. So let me get to these comments real quick. So, yeah, black people's business always supposed to be at the bottom. One hundred percent correct. This is one hundred percent. If one million black folks made a hundred thousand dollars a year, we have national change. It's the number saying this is what I want people to understand. We've been taught that it's a success story. If we get one black person to become a billionaire or to become a few hundred million dollars worth, no disrespect to that person because it's a blessing that they in that position financially. But that doesn't change communities. It changes communities if we got a hundred thousand black people all making a hundred thousand dollars a year. We can change whole communities like that. And it don't have to start at 100 grand. You can work your way to it. But if we can get communities of people making more income wise, we can change everything because we got it on a scale. It doesn't help us to have one Jay-Z and one LeBron. That doesn't help us because that's one person and all that money is aggregated under that one person. So then now that guy's under pressure to try to figure out how can I help everybody? But all your money, that doesn't, from an economic standpoint, that's not good. It's better to have. A million people making a hundred K then have a thousand people that are all worth a billion dollars. So we got to understand is that we've been taught a bad plan for success. That's about creating these black superstars financially and everybody putting all the attention on them. Why the masses of people don't even make $50,000 a year. Right. And that's supposed to be acceptable to us instead of trying to figure out how to raise the income level of everybody else. I tell people all the time, I want you to make as much money as possible be as productive as possible. Why? Because you're going to consume. We're going to tax your consumption. That's going to give us more money to create projects and to create programs. And then we can just keep recycling everything. It doesn't benefit a system that I'm trying to build by making you put you in a position where you're not making enough money. I want you to make as much money as possible because like most people, you're going to consume a lot of that. And I can get my money off consumers, consumption taxes as opposed to taxing your income. But I don't want to sidetrack what I'm talking about, get into an income tax argument. So here's the article that I wanted to show you, right? And then we're going to go into it. I'm also show you this guy's holdings because I want you to understand what you're not being exposed to. And it wasn't until we got things like social media and a lot better investigative reporting because 20, 30 years ago, we would never even know about this type of stuff going on. But it was going on 20, 30 years ago. We just didn't know about it. So let me stop this share screen. Let me go to this new share screen. OK, so here this should be the article. OK, so the article is up. And this is an article from The New York Times. So Fed officials under fire for 2020 securities training to go to resign. So they're getting ready to resign. So S. Kaplan, Robert S. Kaplan, who's the head of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Right. Uh, and, and Eric S. Rosengreen, the head of Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, is retiring earlier than planned. Now, one of them is going to do a medical retirement, but we think it got a lot to do with his trading. And Kaplan, who's going to retire in June, I believe, just as like, yo, I'm out. Right. Um, so Rosen said health reasons and what we're going to talk about, let me go down to the article. So Mr. Kaplan drew scrutiny for buying and selling millions of dollars in individual stocks among other investments last year, trading first reported by the wall street journal, September 7th. He maintained his trades were consistent with fed ethic rules. Well, not saying that it was unethical. What we're saying is that how does it look for the federal reserve people at a high level in federal reserve? to be trading in and out of the market because it creates this idea that they have inside information that's allowing them to trade. And one of the other things we're talking about is that, do we think that their trading activity can potentially impact the market? So if I know that Kaplan is in a, pos a particular position of a company, does it benefit me as maybe a politician or maybe even another business partners to try to make sure that company does as well as possible because I need federal monetary policy to go my way. Now, we say that federal monetary policy is supposed to be ambiguous. It's not supposed to be influenced by anything on the outside. But I keep asking you this question all the time. Who are the people that tell these guys what to do? So we know who tells them what to do. That's Powell. Who's the people that's telling Powell what to do? So everybody's beholden to somebody. Everybody got a boss. 
Nobody's just this independent operator. That's at, that's working at a high level in any business or government. Everybody got somebody that's telling them what to do. So we want to think that maybe their trading is not impacting the overall market, but we're not 100% sure because what if it benefits them to be on a certain side of a trade and I'm trying to do something to help them to make sure that happens because I believe I can get a benefit from them at a later date because of who they are, right? That's pretty much the article. Now, what I want to talk about is their position on the market was that what they call two of the more hawkish federal officials who saw a 2020 rake hike in September of the FOMC. So these were two officials who were looking for a rate hike in 2022. So early 2022, we think that that particular uh, interest rate is going to go up. They were in favor of that. With them being removed, and this one guy was supposed to leave in June, but he said he's going to leave a lot earlier than that. We may continue what we call soft monetary policy, where the interest rate is going to be very, very low. So their removal could impact the overall market. But what they're saying, and I believe they're saying this because they don't want to get investigated, is I'm just going to get out of the way and let y'all do what y'all want to do. Because a lot of times guys that's in these particular positions, they're not really hurting for money. So they're doing, they're not necessarily doing the job because they need the money. They may like the money, but they got a lot of other things because you don't get in these type of positions unless you know people. That's pretty much what it's going to be, that, that particular article. But I want to show you this guy's trades because I want to keep hammering the point is that there's a reason why we're not being exposed to this particular area. So we're going to look at Kaplan's because we actually have Kaplan's trade somewhere. Let me remove this and let me go back to sharing this screen. Oh. This is from Twitter. Okay. So this is Robert Cap. This is Schedule B that he has to file with the IRS. Make sure you can see it. This is his Schedule B that he has to file with the IRS. What we're seeing is that he owns Apple. He owns Alibaba. We see his trading transactions. He owns Amazon. He owns Chevron. He owns Delta Air Airlines. He owns Enterprise. He owned a company called ELG. I think the most outrageous thing that he owned, he owned iShares floating rate bond ETF. I think as his position in the Federal Reserve, I don't think he should be trading in and out of that position. It doesn't really look good. He owns Latin America 40 ETF, Kraft Heinz. He owns Marathon Petroleum. He owns Occidental Petroleum. He owns Oracle, S&P 500 ETF, S&P 500 Value ETF, S&P Index Futures. Tesla, Valero, um, Verizon. And then it shows you the amount of the particular transactions, how he traded in and out of those particular positions. And if you see, it says date, month, year. What it says multiple is because he traded in and out of those positions multiple times. So this guy's an active trader. He's not buying and holding these particular positions. He's actively trading in and out of these positions, right? You also see transaction type. It says purchase and sale, which shows that he purchased and he sold it multiple times. Right. So I want you to understand over the 2020 year, this guy has been a very, very active trader. Then also what you can show and I will link this, the amount of the transaction. It shows you the dollar amount for each transaction. And he has dollar amounts for a lot of these particular companies over one million dollars. So you got to understand that this guy was a very, very active trader. Now, we want to continue to ask you. How come you're never being exposed to this particular space? And everybody that you see in our economy that is at a certain level, they're involved in some level of trading. And it's coming out more and more because of financial disclosures and also because of the Internet with the speed of information. We're finding that more and more people are involved in trading. But you've been taught that you need to stay out of this particular space. And all you should do is just buy a bunch of stock and sit on it. Right. And I guess wait to hit the mother load when you get 75 years old. I'm here to give you argument that I think that you should get involved in trading. Why do I think that you should get involved in trading? The most important thing is that it's going to put you in a position to be successful because you're going to understand how the financial markets actually work. The second thing is that it's going to it can help raise your income level. Our biggest issue that nobody really wants to address is income. We have a lot of income instability and we have something we call capped income where you're not making enough money. 
and you know at the beginning of the year you're not going to make enough money. So you know at the beginning of the year I'm going to make $35,000 a year on this job regardless of what I do. The third thing is the fact that to make the amount of money that you're making, you got to take so much time away from your family. And that's never going to stop. A lot of jobs, if they're going to pay you a certain amount of money, you're going to essentially give them your whole life. I know people that work retail management. They pretty much lived in those stores. Did they make a lot of money? Yes, they lived in the store. I know a sister, she was a divorcee. She had five children. She pretty much spent, I don't know, maybe 60 hours a week in this retail store. She was sometimes open and closing. If somebody didn't come in for work, she had to be there. So she made really good money, right? She was able to provide a good life for her family, but she lived in that store. So we're taught that this is the only model of success that we can go after. And it's because we don't really understand how these markets actually work. So you don't have to trade. But I think you should learn about how trading impacts the market. So then you can maybe potentially trade and you can also teach this to your children because then they will have a skill set that they can utilize that can allow them to generate income for themselves. Because there is no age uh, requirement on trading that I know of. I'm not, don't quote me on that because I'm not an attorney. I'm definitely not a financial attorney. But a younger person can get involved in the markets who may not be as old as us, figure out how to generate some income. And because they're being raised in this environment, as they become older, a lot of these things become a lot easier to them to understand. Right. So we got any questions before we get out of here, because this one going to be long. I want to go and show you that. And this guy Kaplan, he comes out of the Goldman outfit. And a lot of my traders, I get them to understand how widespread that organization is. Uh, he comes out of the Goldman outfit. So that's one of the reasons why he's at where he's at, because you will see those particular guys that come out of that outfit embedded all across our economy. Right. So we got any questions before we get up on out of here. OK, so black America says, I think black people need to file power, power nomics. Dr. Claude Anderson has a plan. I agree. I like his book, uh, Black America Television News and Information. Um, but one thing I, I'm not a fan of in his book um, is to me, it's more academic. And he is an educator, so I can get that as opposed to uh, applied. So I think Dr. Claude Anderson, at his time when he wrote that book, had a good overall understanding, but I'm more of an applied person, which is why I didn't go get a graduate degree or get a PhD in economics. Because once you start going deeper down the economic rabbit hole, it becomes a lot of theoretical stuff as opposed to actual applied stuff. So the work I'm doing right now is applied economics, right? It's actual application of it. As opposed to me sitting in a room and having debates or discussions over economic policy. You understand me? So no disrespect to the educators and no disrespect to the, to the intellectuals and the academics, but we got to reach a point to where things start to become application as opposed to who just has the best idea. You approve what's your idea, whether or not it's valid, but actually going out in the world and creating application of the idea because the marketplace of the world is the best tester of what you think you're doing. So I used to tell people all the time with marketing campaigns, the marketplace is the uh, where you're going to actually determine whether or not your marketing thesis or your marketing offer is valid. Don't be scared to go in the marketplace to find out because then all you got to do is go back into the lab, reconfigure it and go back out again. So I think we need to start investigating how we can get past this particular point of just academic theory and actual application of it. Right. Because Dr. Claude Anderson created that work a good while ago. We're not here to diminish anything he's done, but I think we need to kind of move this to where it's about application of what we're doing and us taking the particular models that may work on our local level and trying to figure out how to scale that out to other areas as opposed to just sitting in a room and talking about our idea about something, right? And But I appreciate the feedback. Yeah, East Sense. Yeah, definitely. Prices are never set. Uh, you try to get a car now brand new, you're going to pay. 
I don't think they're going to be that same price next year this time. But as of right now, brand new cars, even even uh, rental cars are crazy. So prices are never set outside of like the retail environment. And so a lot of people have this belief that well, if I don't buy now, I can come back to David in two weeks and the price will still be the same. Well, that's not really how the market actually functions. Prices are always moving based on market conditions. Like if you look at housing, housing is always moving. They can tell you the price of a particular apartment is this price today. And you literally could come back next week and it could be a whole new price. Why? Because the market is moved. And either you're going to pay the price or you're not going to pay the price. So that creates a lot of buying urgency to make you realize I need to lock this in while I can get this price or else I can come back next week and be paying two, three hundred dollars more for the same particular unit. I feel you. I didn't know we had 30,000 black millionaires. Yeah. And what we're going to see, Roscoe, in the next five to 10 years is this country's going to be spitting millionaires out like this. Because I was reading a, uh, an article and they were talking about if you have a million dollars right now, it's like having around $300,000 $300, 30 years ago. So we got to understand is that a million dollars as being this um, this demarcation line of, of financial success, meaning like you're just rich now, is not what it used to be. And I think that over time, we're going to find that being a millionaire is going to be very, very average in this society because of the way this particular economy works. It's not really, really difficult to make yourself a millionaire in this economy if you understand how to do it. And I'm saying difficult. What I mean is like it, it probably won't take you the rest of your life. Other parts of the world, it is almost impossible to become a millionaire. If you're not born in the money, your ability to work yourself into a million dollars is next to impossible. I, I, I don't agree with, but I understand why certain people in Mexico do what they do. Because there's no way they're going to make a lot of money except doing certain stuff. Because the government has not created an environment that would allow that to happen. So they got to just do a lot of outlandish things. Not saying that I agree with it. But there's not a lot of opportunity there. In America, and people are not going to like me to say this, but I'm going to say this. As black people in America, there's no group of black people in the world that have more financial uh, opportunity than what we have inside the United States. It doesn't disregard a lot of the other challenges that we have. But we don't see ourselves in a position to be very, very successful financially and to use that to branch out to other parts of the world. Where a lot of people, yes, you have gone to other parts of the world and you may have had some financial success. But I'm telling you just my personal opinion. The easiest place for you to get a good financial foundation is here and then try to branch out from there as opposed to trying to go somewhere else and you can't get nothing going over here. And you don't necessarily have the type of environment that's going to allow you to be successful. Right. But that's my personal opinion. I don't mean it's going to work like that for everybody. Peace to uh, Mr. Moore for the uh, 1999 super chat. So we got any questions before we get up on out of here? Yeah, that, that's, that's what I say, GC. But see, when I was in school, um, I asked my economics professor, because I loved, I loved economics. It was really interesting to me, and it was easy to me. And I asked her, I said, are we going to do anything if I go take this on a graduate level? Are we going to do anything except just talk theory all the time? And she was like, no, nah, that's pretty much all you're going to do. Because she had a Ph.D. in economics. It was a sister from Mississippi. And she was like, no, nah, that's all you're going to do is just talk uh, uh, theory all the time. I said, cool, I'm glad you told me that. And I decided that I wasn't going to go past a, a bachelor's degree. So I was a double major in economics and business management. But I was like, there's no way in the world I'm going to get a graduate degree and get a Ph.D. Because to get a job as an economist, you had to at least have a, a graduate degree. But I was like, I'm not going to spend the next four years just debating theory with people with no application. So that's the issue is that a lot of the Ph.D. economists, some of them work in business, but a lot of them work for academic institutions. And so their job is just to be theorists. And we're not saying that they're not needed in our society because thinkers are needed in our society. But the challenge is that um, we haven't really gone into the application. And we start looking at the application because something that I disrespect with a guy like Thomas Sowell, smart guy, 
But I think he doesn't understand that capitalism is in stages. So his perspective of capitalism to me is at a beginning stage. Well, we're past that stage now. We're in 2021. We can't have this mentality that capitalism in the United States of America is operating at a 1900 or 1856 stage. There's been so much consolidation of wealth. There's been so much aggregation of wealth because other people had advantages in this particular society that other people did not have. You're not starting off at an even playing field anymore. Doesn't mean you can't have a level of success, but it means you're not starting off at square one. Right. But they take these individual case studies and they try to infer for millions of people. Well, if you're an economist and you understand statistics, you know, you can't do that. Right. But they're allowed to do this without any challenging of what they're doing, because when you see Thomas Sowell in that environment, that environment that you see him in is designed to promote him. It's not designed to challenge what he's saying. But I didn't learn the statistics that you can take one case, one incident, and then now I can infer for millions of people. I don't know how you do that. What's your confidence rate of that? But that's what they're allowed to do. Or they're allowed to use these analogies that don't really work like, you know, black people are successful in sports because in sports, they're looking for the best athlete. Well, these guys, I can tell they never play sports because there was a time in sports to where if you were black, you were not going to play certain positions. It didn't matter how good you were. Right. Uh, Woody Hayes used to tell his black players in the 70s was coaching for Ohio State. I can't play more black people. I can only play so many black people at a time on the field. Why? Because the boosters would get mad at me if I do that. He used to tell his black players that I don't have a problem with you. But if I play too many black people at one time, my boosters going to get mad. So it took society be, being willing to accept black excellence in sports before you started getting black promotion in sports. But there was a time where the whole Alabama football team was white. Why? Because that's what they wanted at Alabama. It wasn't until they decided to do something different to where they started allowing those athletes to play at that school. Had nothing to do with their ability to play football. That's why for a long time, the best football athletes was at HBCUs. But that's a whole, we don't want to sidetrack it. Do you have any suggested sites to research these institutional traders on how they invest? You Have you heard of, uh, I forgot what the name of that form is. Uh, but if you're an institution, you got to submit a form to the SEC on your trades. I would just look those forms up. So you got to be willing to go into them SEC documents and just do that research. So I would just start with the SEC. There's a certain form that you got to submit uh, of your activity as an institution. I would just submit it. Uh, you saw that was a Schedule B. For some reason, that is public access. So when you're looking at a, 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 a politician, a certain amount of their financial activity has to be available to the public. Or you can do a, a uh, what do you call it? Freedom of Information Act. And you can submit that to a judge and see where they give you the information. So if you're willing to do the research and do the legwork, you can get the information. Now, I would tell you to read the crowd five more times. If you've already read it, just read it five more times. Right. I would tell you, you don't need another book, in my opinion. If you've already read the crowd, read it five more times. Yeah, the issue is that what is a millionaire going to mean? We know, so we believe now that being a millionaire is like having three hundred thousand. Being having a million dollars cash is like having three hundred thousand dollars cash thirty years ago. Well, in ten years, having a million dollars cash is going to mean what? Because I used to live in, in Metro Atlanta. You could have a million dollars cash in Atlanta and go buy you a townhome, and you might have a hundred thousand dollars left if you're lucky. And you're not going to get a big townhome. You're going to get a two-story townhome on a really small lot. Go to like that uh, uh, that Ponce de Leon area over there by Old Fourth Ward or Old Fifth Ward that they're redeveloping. They got real small townhomes. Go to that Smyrna area. They got $800,000 townhomes over there. You can have a million dollars cash in downtown Atlanta and, and, and buy a townhome. And maybe if you're lucky, have $100,000 to work with after that. So we got to start asking ourselves, what is a million dollars really going to mean? And so. It's better to have a group of people that have income that can work with each other than to just have these individual case studies of this person having a large level of success. Because this is what we happens. This is what happens to a lot of black people that get individually financially successful. They're supporting five or six other people. 
they don't have a mechanism to help those five or six other people become financially successful. So what happens? They just become a drain. So you see this professional athletes. The professional athlete A becomes successful. He signs for millions of dollars. He comes from poverty. Nobody else in his family knows what to do to be a benefit to him. They just got their hand out. He can't use his ability as a professional athlete to make them successful because he gets paid from his job. So then what happens is in 10, 15 years, he right back with them being in poverty. Because we don't have skilled people. We got to develop skill sets to make money as opposed to hoping that you hit this lotto ticket and you get rich. Because the problem is that the lotto ticket don't help anybody else because it's not a skill. I can take what I know and teach it to somebody else. If I'm just really good at playing sports, I can't teach that to nobody else because most people are never going to be professional athletes. Exactly. Yeah. Trades and high paying jobs. Definitely. We got to really start dealing with this income and nobody wants to talk about it. You know, we we are a very low income group as black people aggregated. That's one of the reasons why we at the bottom of this society. We don't make enough money. Right. We just don't. And we got to stop looking at celebrities and athletes. We don't bring in enough because we haven't really had a movement to try to figure out how to solve that problem. We got to stop talking about the wealth problem just as the problem. It's an income problem. But nobody wants to deal with that because it's really about making people skilled. See, we can say, well, here's how you solve the wealth problem. Buy my course and buy a whole bunch of stock. If we're going to solve the income problem, we got to start trying to figure out how to develop skilled people. And that takes a lot of work. And we don't want to do that because that's hard. So it's easy for me to say, hey, just buy my course and buy a whole bunch of stock. And now we solve the wealth problem. But dealing with the income problem means that we got to start trying to figure out how to upskill people, most importantly, upskilling men. And if we understand how this society is set up, it's designed to marginalize black men to make sure that they're the lowest income group of the, of, of the world. Make sure that there's going to be a lot of employment disparity, things of that nature, because if we can harm them, that's going to impact the whole community. Why? Because we got a bunch of men that one, they can't get no work. To, if they can't get work. If they can't get work, they underemployed. And then if they do get the job, they're not making enough money. So then you'd be a good candidate for incarceration, drug abuse, things of this nature. So these are the issues that we don't want to deal with from an economic standpoint. Right. And this idea that. Well, if you're just the best qualified, you're going to get the job. That's not how job markets work. Right. They don't work that way. It works. that It sounds good in theory, but that's not how job markets work. Right. It sounds good in theory to say that. Yeah, I remember Dr. Kimbrough. I don't know what happened to him. He used to be on the Internet a lot. Um, I remember him. You know, we need more people. See, and that's what I tell people about Atlanta. And a lot of people don't get it. D.C. did the same thing at one time. It's just that they got off the ball and they got gentrified out of that area. What Atlanta did with um, with government employment is they created income stability. And so what happens is you have areas in Atlanta where you got a lot of black people uh, because so many of them work not only in government, they work in private sector too, but so many of them work in government. They have income stability, which means now they have stability from an economic standpoint. So now they can start building and they can now start trying to figure out how to build up vertically and also how to expand horizontally. A lot of these areas of the country where you got these large, dense areas of black people, there's so much lack of economic and income. There's so much ec economic or uh, income instability. You can't build anything because you're so unstable. So one of the things that they were able to do in Atlanta with certain groups of people is that they were able to create that level of stability. The problem is that a lot of people still got left out. Now, one of the reasons why a lot of people got left out is because um, affirmative action is being undercut where the largest beneficiary of affirmative action policy is a white woman, not black people. But we can't talk about that. So a lot of us are not really receiving a lot of the benefits of, of the affirmative action program. And on top of that, we don't know how to train people to be skilled to better make more money. So if you're against affirmative action, cool. You don't want it. Cool. I'll take it, but you don't have to take it. But on top of that, we have to figure out how to develop skilled people. And so my thing is that we don't really understand what an a, a area looks like where we have a large level of income stability. 
We just know what the area looks like. We have large areas of income instability. And then we believe that that's every black area. And I've been telling the people on this internet for a long time. I know areas of Atlanta that are pretty much black dominated that a lot of these people on the internet can't even afford to buy a house over there. They don't have enough money. They don't want you to know that though, but they don't have enough bread. If you go to Cascade, if you don't have a million dollars plus, you can't get a house. Okay, so the 30,000 are mostly business owners and real estate investors. I believe that. I really, but especially uh, the, the 30,000 millionaires, I believe that. I really do. Yeah, Lindell. And I'm, this is the thing about Thomas So, Smart guy. He's a very intelligent person. But he's acting as if we're in the early stage of capitalism, and that's not where we're at anymore. And I don't understand. I don't know. I said a lot of these people have taken oaths to, to miseducate the public. I don't know why he doesn't seem to know that. So capitalism goes in stages. It doesn't stay fixed. It's not static. A lot of his theories are as if we're still in like this 1856 stage of capitalism. And it's not like that anymore. So that's just where I disagree with him. But a lot of these people have made this guy a quote unquote standard bearer of black. And, you know, everybody should listen to Thomas Sowell. But no disrespect to Mr. Sowell. He's an academic. When do we get to a stage where we leave the academic arena and we go out here in the real world and we actually do this stuff? And that's where you're going to lose a lot of these people. Yeah, but see, Black American television news and information is that the role of, of you in this particular uh, organization is to be the athlete. So the higher level management position, like a vector director, CEO, even GM, or director of player personnel, you know, you don't get the job just because you qualify. That's not how jobs work. That's the lie we've been taught. If I just got a good resume, I can get, no, you get the job a lot of times because you know somebody. So when it starts turning into you got to be networked in to get these particular positions, we see why we don't get them. Right. But we're the actual talent. And like I said, because we don't have the group direction, we can't utilize the sports positions to create opportunities for people outside of sports. It's just push more people into sports. We've been making money in sports for 30, 40 years. We don't have a lot to show for it, though, because it's individual situations. It's not group. Yeah, cheap is relative, right? Cheap is relative. So we got any questions before we get up and out of here? So it's Saturday. I appreciate the 58 people that came out. We still shooting for the 100 on the uh, the live stream. All right, that'll be a good interview. He used to be a lot. I used to listen to him a lot on blog talk, but that's like when that was a thing. So that'll be a good interview. Um, but he used to be a lot more active on social media, but maybe something happened the way he don't have that ability. And, you know, sometimes people get burned out on social media, but he's hundred percent correct. We got to spread out. The income got to be more spread. It can't be locked up in three or four people. And then we supposed to look at them as, well, I want to be like them, but everybody don't have to be a billionaire to be successful in this society. We can get a lot more people to make a lot more money and to start creating that stability because it's that instability is what's destroying families where something happens. And the whole family gets derailed for the next 10, 15 years because their life is so tenuous. Right. So that's the issue. Malik Vanderpool, just catch it on the replay. Right. Because the only real benefit of being, you know, so just catch it on the replay. I'm not tripping on being shadow banned. Just catch it on the replay and we'll take it from there. Yeah, I remember that, but so uh, a dang bay, if I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly. I remember he he created that plan, right? Um, the, the, they have a right to reject the plan, right? They don't have to accept his plan. They have a right to reject the plan. 
Okay, so now what's next? You understand what I'm trying to say? Just because he's Dr. Claude and said don't mean they got to accept his plan. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? They have a right to reject his plan. So now what's next? So it's no disrespect to Dr. Claude Innocent because we respect his work and we respect the, the, you know, what he's produced to try to help people get an understanding of the environment that they live in. But we have to, you know, start focusing on what are we going to do to put ourselves in a position to be successful? Because if if what was going to defeat us is they rejected the plan, so that now we just are, are ass out, we was never going to be successful in the first place because everything was hinged on them accepting the plan. Two, I don't live in Detroit. So whether they accepted that plan or not, it wasn't going to change nothing in my life. Right? When that plan was going through, I was still in the state of Florida. So whether they accepted that plan or not, nothing was going to change for me. You understand me? So that's why I talk about localized solutions, get away from this national stuff, and stop making these people the standard bearers of our success. Because what they do got very little to no effect on somebody else in another part of the country. Right. No disrespect to them and what they do. You understand me? But I, I remember this. He worked for the. Uh, the governor of the state of Florida at one time, I think he also worked with the Carter administration. Um, but, yeah, I remember that story coming out. But. That's you know, it is what it is. But that don't discourage me. So we got any questions before we bounce out. But all, all you know, big up to Dr. Claude Ennis and everything that he's uh, done, the work that he's produced. We're not trying to downplay his contribution. You understand me? OK, so we're going to wrap it. Hope everybody have a safe weekend. We're getting ready to roll into the fall. You can tell because of weather, the temperatures changing, especially feel it at night. So be safe. Do what you got to do. This is David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave. Talk to you later.